Hello YouTube, ShadowHero90 here. This is a new series I'm going to be doing called Sexism in Movies and TV. You see, the reason I do this is not because there's just sexism in the shows that I watch, but a lot of fictional characters kids see as role models and want to grow up to be like them and although I don't really have a list of actual jerks well every boy needs a good role model and this is really more of a list of fictional jerks that without a good role model well a lot of young boys could grow up to be just like And since we don't want any of, well, not just American youth, but the children of any country or gender to grow up to be like, well, real live versions of the jerks on that list, that's why I'm doing this series and essentially pointing out double standards hypocrisy and how many TV shows and movies have degenerated into piles of misandric garbage. Note, I do like certain shows. I like most of the shows on this list and it's not so much a as a criticism. Well, it kind of is, but there are parts where these shows need to be improved. Okay, in this episode I'm doing the episode of Saved by the Bell, The Substitute, which pretty much works like this. Um, the drama teacher throws out her back and thus bringing in the need for a substitute the who is basically a lot more handsome charming and sophisticated than Zack Slater and Screech could ever hope of being 
and this basically does get the attention of every girl in school. Well, every girl at Bayside. Later at the and later at the max. Well, as you can see, well, as you can see here, this talking orangutan like bitch and that's a metaphor for she's an unevolved idiot basically just says what her and the two sluts are basically thinking that Zack Slater and Screech are immature little boys and that the drama teacher is a man and is not immature. And it accelerates past school grounds where slut number one and slut number two are basically and, and even the talking orangutan are fantasizing about getting married to this guy. So the three boys basically try to hire an actress to pretend to be the substitute's fiance in hopes of getting their girls back. And when con when confronted they explain their situation. Yeah, that ever since he came, they don't... Yeah, they act like they don't exist. So... The sub basically agrees to pretend that the actress, after giving her a call, is his fiance, and everything goes back to normal. In all fairness, this episode could have been written way better than it actually was. And yes, this is Saved by the Bell, the show that did PSAs, had all sorts of life lessons, blah, 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 and had the, the big drug episode slash PSA that Family Guy recently parodied because of how hypocritical it was. Well, now here's actually how you would do a better ending to this episode. Just have Zack, Slater, and Screech act like they have a crush on any other girl that's not these three bimbos and act like they don't exist Ju or pretend that what happened got them thinking they're working on schoolwork and they completely ignore them or have a or bring in a girl that they pretend to have a crush on and drive, well, set things up so that this new girl would out, well, basically would be more popular than the cheerleading bimbo, dress better than the fashion model wannabe, and be smarter than the feminazi bitch. Yeah, and she'd have to be more attractive because Saved by the Bell was unbelievably shallow. Okay, well, as controversial as Saved by the Bell tries to be and how intelligent and how they try to do PSAs to teach lessons and all that shit. Another, an actual cartoon show made at least four, three to four years later actually covered this same exact scenario but did it ten times better. 
Tiny Toon Adventures did the Magnificent Three, in which Babs Bunny, Shirley the Loon, and Fifi La Fume view Buster, Plucky, Hampton, and every other boy at their school as immature. Fifi actually got invitations to a senior dance at another school and it actually shows that the whoever was at this senior dance saw the three of them as kids and I really have to give credit to this guy for putting Shirley the Loon in her place when he really metaphorically crammed her quote unquote keen intellect down her throat by using her his words to turn her into a baby. Okay, and basically the episode, after a really good horror reference, does end with Babs, Shirley, and Fifi learning that they're not really as mature as they think they are, and the episode ends up that well alone. Ironically, a cartoon that is viewed as being silly and for kids basically takes the, ex the same exact scenario that an episode of Saved by the Bell, a show that's meant to be serious and teach life lessons, and Tiny Toons does it 10 times better and 30 times more realistically than Saved by the Bell could have ever dreamed of. But then there's the fact that Saved by the Bell was written by hacks. Everyone on that show is a complete asswipe. But so really, what would you expect? I'm just saying, the big problem with this episode is literally what pandering losers Zack and Slater are going to such extremes to get rid of this guy. I mean, he's a substitute. He'll be gone in a week. I mean, Zack and Slater are apparently such shallow dickheads that they need to have a skinny girl on their arm to avoid looking like losers. That sends a horrible message. It teaches girls that all these boys you're around are immature and it teaches boys that you're immature but you need to have a skinny woman around your arm or else well they don't put fill in the or else part but you see where I'm going hello YouTube welcome to the official season 2 premiere of sexism in movies and TV and this is basically just a visual well, visual intro as to what I'll be tearing into today, uh, unless, well, just for the purpose of if you haven't read the description. In fairness, from what I see, the silly kids cartoon took a scenario, well, the silly kids cartoon and the serious show for both kids and teenagers that teaches life lessons both had an episode with the exact same scenario but the but the silly cartoon show did did it way better than the serious 
show or the sitcom that teaches life lessons or whatever you want to call it. And yeah, Tiny Toons version of girls thinking boys are immature and trying to date a more mature male. Tiny Toons took that idea and did it infinitely better than Saved by the Bell ever could. And that's what I'm saying in closing. Okay, so last season on sexism in movies and TV, I reviewed the Saved by the Bell episode known as The Substitute from the first season. So, it shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you guys watching that I would eventually tackle the Season 2 episode, Jesse's Song. Yes, this is the notorious drug episode. The episode in which Jesse, who is supposed to who is supposed to be a, a beacon of morality, essentially lets down her friends, does drugs, just for a shot at a good college. Yes. And I know what you're thinking. This episode is one of the prime examples of why of why virtue signaling has such a bad reputation because that's exactly what this is. This episode is nothing more than NBC's cheap attempt to gain social brownie points by saying that drugs are bad. Something that anyone with a decent brain would already know. And, as we can all tell, it didn't work. The episode starts out... Well, it starts out with... Jesse with Zack and Slater at their hangout, the Max. And Jesse is drinking coffee, so she doesn't need to sleep. So she'll actually have a chance to pass geometry. Kelly and Lisa show up and tell Jesse to get some rest because she's stressing herself out. And to be honest, that's Kind of a good point. Jesse, who has a one-track mind and an ego the size of Texas, is stressing herself out so much that it's only logical that her own obsession would get her so stressed out that she'd flunk her geometry test. Jesse, Lisa, and Kelly start singing, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Zach mentions that a friend of his dad's is a record producer. And the minute Slater suggests a name for their band, Jesse, Jesse calls him a pig, which, you know, is kind of ironic since she is basically a parasite. People like pigs. No one likes parasites. And the school she goes to is run by a man. Weird that she never had any problems with this. Especially since later in the episode, she kind of gets into an argument with him 
And this is the only episode where Principal Belding is something more than a moron. He's actually smart in this episode. Oh, yeah. And then there's the fact that the class that Jesse wants to pass so badly is also taught by a man, which is also hypocritical of her. In all fairness, I can't believe they haven't done an episode, they never did an episode of this show where Jesse gets repulsed by this, leaves her school to go to a school run by a woman, it blows up in her face, and then she has to come back to her old school like a dog with her tail tucked between her legs. Zack agrees to be their manager and says they'll make a fortune. And it goes as about as well as you'd expect. And then, in the geometry class, Jesse gets a C. And believe me, this will not go over well. Yeah, as you can see here, Jessie's greed and her fragile little ego cannot handle getting a C on a geometry test because she thinks that will somehow not allow her to get into Stanford. Slater agrees to help Jessie study, blah, blah, blah. Zack disguises, um, what's his name? Oh yeah, Screech, and sends him into the girls' room to record the girls singing. Now here's something I want to point out. If Jesse, in universe, had any chance of getting into a school like Stanford, she would actually have been smart enough to point out that that was Screech in disguise. But since she can't, it should be painfully obvious. Whether or not she passes the geometry, geometry test or not, she will not get into Stanford. Slater is helping Jesse study. And then Zack breaks into her bedroom to tell her what he did. Originally, she gets pissed off and says this is a violation, which in itself is indeed a massive contradiction. In an earlier episode of Saved by the Bell, titled House Party, which, yes, I am going to cover, Slater does tell Jesse that they're having a guy's night in. Knowing this, the four bitches essentially spy on them, laugh at them, and cause property damage of a statue of Elvis. She's basically just being a hypocrite, because as shown in the episode House Party, she is just as about, she's equally guilty. In fact, her actions were actually worse as she was spying on them, laughed at them, and her jackassery indirectly led to property damage. And I don't really think she cared that the producer liked her, 
because of her deranged obsession. Okay, Slater's on his way out, and then that's when Jesse tells him about the Keep Alert caffeine pill drugs that she's taking. Yeah, this bitch is on drugs. Because Slater isn't a moron, he actually reads what the pills are made of and makes a good point when he says that they're a lot stronger than coffee. And Slater actually reads what's on the bottle and finds out that they could be habit forming, which translates to addictive, as in drug addiction. But Jessie, being the egocentric pinhead that she is, thinks they'll be harmless and doesn't think they'll affect her at all. And with Slater gone, the monkey goes back to taking drugs, like the idiot she is. After the credits, Jesse has a talk with Principal Belding, who actually, in a state of wisdom, he tells her that she can't get everything she wants, which is actually a good piece of wisdom. Jesse here is essentially nothing but a spoiled brat who doesn't deserve to get into Stanford. She deserves to end up on the streets. Principal Belding does agree to help Jesse find a college to get into. And says whether or not she believes it, there is a college out there for the evil Zach Morris. And... And hearing that actually scares Jesse. She has a sick fantasy where she ends up at the same college as Zach. Even though she technically did end up at the same college as Zach Morris during one of the sequels. Or at least I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I never saw any of the sequels. I did not see Saved by the Bell the college years. But I'm pretty sure she would have been in it. Zack tells the girls that the record producer liked what he heard from them. But they're only going to have one shot at this because the producer is actually looking into other girl bands. Zach comes up with the idea to make a music video for the producer to make him like them more. After the music video was made, the recording company loved it. And they want to see a live performance. That night, but since Jessie is so obsessed with the midterm, she now has to choose. Follow her buffoon feminist path and let down all her friends when they're counting on her. Or essentially get a chance to ace the midterm, which won't even guarantee that she'd get into Stanford. Because I know from watching this crap series that... She thinks she gets elect 
she thinks she's school valedictorian, but Screech is actually the one to be school valedictorian, and he actually just let her win. While well, going to borrow a pen in Jessie's backpack, Slater actually finds the caffeine pills and questions Jessie on it. Slater tells her he's worried about her and to give him the pills. Now, if he was really worried about her or had any form of a brain, he would go to an adult, in this case, Principal Belding. Jessie's retard mother would actually approve of her daughter doing this, believe it or not. Okay, Jessie took the midterm, and she doesn't even want to check it over because she's got such a massive ego. And... Well, yeah, she's high on caffeine pills. Slater tells Zack about the caffeine pills, which really doesn't amount to anything. But when Zack comes to pick Jessie up for the big show, she is completely out cold. And when Jessie has a breakdown and reaches for the pills, Zack be Zack actually realizes that Slater was right. Zack holds Jessie down. Screech fills in for Jessie at the show, and Jessie completely lets her friends down all of them. Okay, now this is where the episode gets completely fucked up. If the, if the morons at NBC actually knew what they were doing when writing this, it wouldn't have ended the way it d does now, with Jesse going to counseling with her mom for her drug addiction and ending it on a joke about how Zack learned he couldn't be good at everything the first time he got all C's on his report card. No, this is actually one of the reasons why virtue signaling has the horrible reputation that it does. You see, here, I mean, here's a, well, here's a good ending for this episode. If this episode actually had a decent ending, it would have ended with Jesse finding out that, that Stanford turned her down and all her friends essentially telling her they don't want anything to do with her. And it would end with her getting into a shit college with no friends whatsoever. This episode is a PSA on drugs, and it clearly didn't work out. Because here's what the episode was telling impressionable kids in the 90s. You can do drugs, let down your friends, and you will get your happy ending. It doesn't matter. And that's not exactly... Well, yeah, that is why this episode is so fucked up. Another cartoon to do this in the 1990s, and yeah, I know that I'm comparing Saved by the Bell to Tiny Toons again, as in 
they did a plot line similar to this and like Tiny Toon, well, yeah, Tiny Toons did it way better than Saved by the Bell could, even though that show was meant to be taken more seriously. In the episode One Beer, Buster, Plucky, and Hampton in the episode One Beer took a plot line similar to the Saved by the Bell episode Jesse's Song and did it ten times better. The episode featured Buster, Hampton, and Plucky getting drunk after having their first beer then driving drunk to their deaths. I mean, I know they reveal it all to be a cartoon at the end, but the characters essentially revealed the dangers of drunk driving and showed that it has consequences. The Saved by the Bell Season 2 episode, Jesse's Song, essentially taught kids that nothing bad comes from doing drugs, and that is a really fucked up moral. And just for the record, this will not be the last time I review an episode of this piece of crap. Okay, like I said in episode 24, eventually I am going to review the episode of Saved by the Bell titled House Party, and this is going to be that review. But before I go through the misandry in this man-hating piece of shit. Well, first, I think I should go over some plot points to expose, well, you know, to that I should go over some plot points to expose why this episode of Saved by the Bell is so goddamn sexist. Screech's mom has a statue of Elvis that is very important to her. She says, screaming at Zack, Elvis is not a toy. And then she said she would just die if anything were to ever happen to it. Kind of showing how important this item is to her. She also has a dog named Hound Dog that is also very important to her. That's plot point number two. Plot point number three. Before leaving, Screech's mom gives Zack and Screech a list of rules. One of which is no girls and one of which is no party. Plot point number four, when Zack and Slater come over and they basically just act like nerds, Jesse and the other three girls in this episode come over, not only breaking one of the rules, but them laughing at the nerds leads to them breaking the Elvis statue which is probably one of the reasons why this is so sexist. You're probably wondering how that works. So allow me to explain by using kind of a comparison to episode 24. In the episode Jesse's Song, Jesse did drugs, which led 
to her not only betraying her friends, but also having some kind of breakdown. But that's beside the point. Okay, I guess episode 24 isn't the best comparison, but this bitch has literally done even worse. She cost her school big, well, okay, she punches her stepbrother when he's introduced for calling her just a chick. She insults her boyfriend who doesn't even like her to start for being masculine. She jumps on and attacks Zack at every opportunity and in the episode I'm reviewing now is guilty of property damage and home invasion. So uh, yeah, this is sexist. Zach Morris might have done some really horrible, rotten, and evil things, but as far as I know, he never took things as far as to smash someone's property. Anyone who's watched Either one of these shows would know that Zach Morris is evil incarnate. But, Home Invasion and Destruction of Property are still far worse crimes than anything he's ever committed, to the best of my knowledge. And I'm pretty sure that goes for assault of someone two to five years younger than you as well. Almost every episode may be about Zach Morris's latest evil scheme, but at least he's not breaking into people's homes and smashing their property. Commercial break, and Screech has a sick fantasy. And then they decide they'll get another statue. Violet, then Violet reveals that she broke up with Maxwell, who was obviously a jerk. Lisa managed to find a replacement for the Elvis statue. But unfortunately, it costs 250 bucks. I wonder what our self-righteous protagonists are going to do about this problem. Maxwell shows up, acts like a jerk. Then Zack gets an idea on how to teach Maxwell a lesson, while at the same time getting the $250 for the Elvis statue. And what's Zack's big plan exactly? Well, he invites Maxwell Nerdstrom to a poker game, hoping that he can win the $250 off of him. But Max is actually really good at poker. As the poker night unfolds, Zack actually begins to run out of money. So they need something worth 50 bucks. So Zach Morris, in his arrogance, decides to bet Hound Dog. But only after Maxwell personally suggested it. They all 
convince Screech to let Zack wager Hound Dog. And Nerdstrom reveals that he had a better poker hand than Zack, and therefore he now legally owns Hound Dog. Or illegally, but that doesn't really matter. After the commercial break, Screech snaps and strangles Zack Morris. Why he didn't do this years earlier is beyond me. After assaulting him and being stopped by Principal Belding, Zack and Slater ask Nerdstrom if there's anything they could give him in exchange for Hound Dog, and he says he'll only do it if they get Jesse to go on a date with him. Now, after everything Jesse's done in this episode, spying on them, which led to the Elvis statue getting smashed, I'm pretty sure this is a fair or in this case, more than fair, compromise. Both Slater and Zack acknowledge that Jesse is not going to like having to go on a date with this guy to get back a dog that was only lost because of Zack's actions, to which something but technically, Zack would never have even pulled the stunt he had pulled if Jesse hadn't have gotten the Elvis statue smashed. So Zack's big plan to get money for the Elvis statue is just to throw a party, even though Screech's mom said they weren't allowed to throw a party. Then, after Jessie asks what she can do to help, Zack and Slater tell her that she's going to have to go on a date with Maxwell Nerdstrom. And you know, after everything she's done, breaking and entering with three other girls, something that was most likely her idea in the first place. And smashing the Elvis statue, this chimpanzee bitch has the gall to say no. After everything she did that wrecked Screech's life, whether directly or indirectly, she doesn't really feel like she has an obligation to help by going on a date with this guy. And then, after Jesse's response, Zack decides to try and use guilt to force Jesse into his plan, or in this case, his deal. Which is kind of confusing, because we are talking about Jesse from Saved by the Bell. You know, the same character who thought that she could break into someone's house, disobey their rules, destroy their property, do drugs to achieve her goal, and act unbelievably entitled and self-centered about it. Suddenly, that character has a conscience, but in keeping with her horrible character, she expects Nerdstrom, who is an extreme womanizer to keep 
his paws to himself. Not gonna happen, you filthy cunt. They have their party. Jesse and Nerdstrom go on a date. And then when one of Nerdstrom, Nerdstrom's friends brings Hound Dog, Nerdstrom actually wants to end the date with a kiss. And then... Zack tricks Nerdstrom into kissing Hound Dog. <clears throat> so anyways, Screech stands up for Violet. They do the typical happy ending, the end, blah blah blah, yada yada. Now I've said that Jessie is a cunt. I called her that in this review. Now I've called Jessie a cunt in this review, and this is where the review ends. But I still have much more to say on this bitch. And you'll see that in a future installment of Sexism in Movies and TV. And not only will it be a new installment, but it will be a new segment called, well, a new segment that will be a part of Sexism in Movies and TV. This show. The one that you're watching.